some interesting things about John. Here I was, this 15-year-old little scrawny kid, and he was just so cool about the whole process. With John Hughes, he had his pulse on adolescence. You know, in general, he had a really good sense of it. There was always this feeling that John never really grew up, you know, that he was one of those characters who he still could think like a teenager. He remembered what it was like to be a teenager. He knew that when you're an adolescent, the world is so centered around what you're going through and everything filters through that. I mean, these are all things that you can go to be clinical about, but he wasn't clinical about it. He, you always felt like he lived it. I think that John... Um, because of his work in Lampoon and because of his sort of vivid imagination and writing style was not too far apart emotionally from the teenage years and there were things that had happened to him that he had remembered. So whether he had a pulse on teens at that time, he had a pulse on teens of his generation and he spoke to some sort of truth. My experience of John is that he is an incredibly, he was very open when we do Breakfast Club. He is very sensitive, um, very funny, really excited about making his movie, and not a person who's cut off from how he feels about anything. Just, you know, sort of delighted by everything. I just don't feel that there are a lot of filmmakers out there with the same affection for, for youth culture that, that John Hughes clearly had. John probably felt that he was maybe sick of the term kids movie being a negative term. Meaning, oh, if it's a kids movie, then it can't really be about anything. Then it will be frivolous. Whereas, I think we all remember some of our most serious times in our lives have been in high school when you're the big, you know, you're, you look back and you go, what an idiot. But it's like, you, things were very serious. Things that were of great concern to you in high school. Anybody can copy him is what the problem is. You know, he's just so original and pulling the people in and his ideas. And I know that there are lots and lots of movies and television shows about the kids in high school, the group in high school, but I don't think anybody can quite get that particular style that he has and that he always had. So, you know, what are you going to do? It was only him. I think John's narrative voice took everything in another direction because he had a great ear for dialogue, for talent, for character for everything he was able to sort of see it all and put it all together he must have known that he had essential stories to tell about high school and he must have been so aware of the moment that he was living in the mid 1980s because every detail in his movies even now looks right it's it's like going through your yearbook and I think that's why kids my age loved those movies so much was because they really I remember when the breakfast club came out and I was a junior in high school it just seemed like, finally, someone made a movie about what I think about and how I feel. And you sort of identify those songs, not just from a period, but for, from periods in those films. I remember at the time, part of the myth of John Hughes that we all knew about as young filmmakers was he sat at a desk and he played all this great music all the time and that, you know, the music was a big part of what he did and that that was his sensibilities. Now, I have no idea if there's any truth to that. I have no idea whatsoever, but that's what we all believed. The way John does things, it's like he pin drops sounds and he pin drops attitudes. That's how he makes his films, which is highly unusual because he's on the pulse of something. He had his ear to the curb, so to speak, in terms of music. Yeah, he always sort of integrated that into the writing and, the, and also the producing of the films. It's the way the songs were juxtaposed with the scenes that made them effective. I mean, the songs themselves are not super cutting edge, but they're, they're, they're used so well. They're not just dropped in there. You know, the timing is always impeccable. And I always appreciated that there was the David Bowie quote at the beginning of The Breakfast Club, even though I don't believe we actually hear that song changes. It's such a great quote. proudest thing about Breakfast Club, um, it's more than anything performances or characters or anything else. That David Bowie quote was mine. I found that David Bowie quote in the beginning of the movie and I showed it to John and he thought it was great and then he never said another word about it and I saw the movie for the first time and there it is, like right in the front of the movie. That's my proudest moment. And Don't You Forget About Me is amazing because it's just this like soaring anthem and you get that sense of triumph at the end of the movie with Bender, you know, pumping his fist in the air and 
It's, I mean, if you think about it, it was just a movie about a Saturday spent in detention, and yet you feel like some kind of battle has been won. You know, that's, that's effective use of music. Yeah, that song, I can't believe it. That song is still, you know, it's around all the time. It's funny when you see a new generation discovering things that are so familiar. You know, have you heard this amazing song by Simple Minds? Yes. Yes, I have. Visita mi canal. Hughes wrote a great script. It's not like he's precious about each word. He's precious about his own sense of truth. You want the truth? Yeah, I want the truth. I think he said that he um, had written Breakfast Club a really a long, long, long time before. And he had it in the drawer or something. You know, in the industry, it's called a talking heads movie, where people, you know, there formerly had been films like My Dinner with Andre, or, you know, maybe European films where it's so simplified. But with that, it was really like filming a play. John said something like that he wrote the first draft in a weekend. And both Amelia and I, it was almost simultaneously, I was like, first draft, okay, how many drafts do you have? And he said, well, I got a, a few, why? And Amelia and I were like, can we, can we um, read them? This is during the rehearsal process. So he's like, sure, hey. So we read them. I was like, John, so how about if we put this? He was like, sure, let's try it. John was awesome about uh, making sure we had rehearsal time, which is like a foregone conclusion these days. You don't have that. You just show up on the set, you know, where's my trailer, where's my makeup? But with that, we rehearsed it. We really sat, just the six of us, in a room while the sets were still being finished and made. And, you know, we all had a lot of time to talk about it and share our insights about what we were going to do and how it could play out. But the rehearsal was key. Yeah, I really thought uh, that that's how they made movies. It certainly is the best way to go about making a good movie, I think, is when everyone's on the same page and confident and ready. He just wanted everybody to come in, you know, with their character and start playing around. That's how he shot it. I mean, he was so open to anything that anybody brought in or anything that happened in the scene, you know, any riff that you do off his writing. He wasn't precious about anything. Claire, you want to see a picture of a guy with elephantitis of the nuts? Elephantitis of the nuts or whatever. Judd came up. I, I don't know where that came from. John let us have five, six takes. I mean, his shooting ratio is pretty high, I think. And then he would let us go off, and occasionally what went off would be used. There was a lot more improvisation. We had a, a script supervisor, Bob Forrest, I think his name was. How you doing, Bob, if you're out there? Um, I think Bob came out, he was cajoled out of retirement to do The Breakfast Club. And shortly after the completion of Breakfast Club, he, he for sure retired. Mole really pumps my nads. Well, yeah. He stopped taking notes and brought in a little tape recorder that he would like turn on because we just because Hughes would put that 1,500 foot mag on the camera and like that stuff like Anthony Michael Hall is just genius of him when he's uh, getting stoned and you know chicks they can't hold a smoke and he's like it's going on and we did a few takes of it and he's literally going on and on you can hear eventually the click 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 of the film in the mag, because it's run out, and it's just going around. We're all aware of it. It's not like Hughes doesn't know what that sound is, but we're going to watch Michael for a while. Why not? He's great. <laughs> Chicks cannot hold a smoke. That's what it is. It's hard to try and, and uh, recreate teen speak when you're not a teenager. It is, and it's, it's, it's hard to make it sound authentic. And I don't think there's a false note in, in terms of the vernacular in any of John Hughes' films. Can you hear this? Do you want me to turn it up? I think a lot of it he made up. Like in Breakfast Club, like, a, what does he call the guy? Like a magna zoom dweeby or something? I don't think that was pre, like a pre-existing insult. Um, but it's so awesome, and, and people remember it. Face it, you're a neo-maxi zoom dweeby. Neo-maxi zoom dweeby. Every single character pretty much in the movie has him in it. He said Allison is me, but he also said that everybody's me. Just in terms of telling the story of these five specific stereotypes, what worked is no matter who you were, you can put yourself in one of those boxes. So that made, right from the start, it makes the film very relatable. Everybody's gone to high school. So there's a good chance that you're going to reach a very big audience because everybody knows what you're talking about. Saturday, March 24th, 1984. Shermer High School, Shermer, Illinois. He's just able to pull it out and not be trite about it or not be 
overly simple about it. They're complicated, all his characters. All of them, actually, even in the really broad comedies. They're complicated. It's John's heart. It's just awesome. I think that it's demonstrated by all of the characters in all of his films. It just kind of opened up those doors and said, you know, these stereotypes are there because kids in general need a place to hide when they're in high school. And you sort of hide in your, in your little box. People can relate to being marginalized in whatever way in a relationship, in a family, at home, because of their ethnicity, whatever. You know? And uh, I think what's interesting, the film dares to kind of attack that in a way by using these characters. So it was, a, it was a brilliant idea. Those little moments where you see where these kids are coming from, where they've already had to put on their armor, and just the way the car drives away from Ali and on the whole thing, you know, it's very subtle at the beginning. It gives us a nice setup to those guys. And the fact that Bender has no parent. That he's just walking on his own. I mean, I think that those are really good setups. I think that the kids have a lot of armor that they slowly uh, take off during the, during the film. That was the biggest challenge, is having them arrive at school with their coats and giving them their ID, so to speak. You already get a feeling of what you're dealing with with these guys. Marilyn Vance had these boards. They're like um, vision boards, basically, that somebody will make with, you know, um, ideas for different characters and cutouts from magazines. And she just had, like, Allison was all over it. It was just fantastic. That was to John's direction because when you're sitting in a, a space for a long time and you're just looking at each other and you're in a room of strangers and you start, you know, the air gets tight and you get all those feelings and suddenly one's taking off the coat and, you know, you're kind of adjusting to your atmosphere. And that's the progression. That's the genius of these films is that the level of the young characters and the older characters, they are not caricatured even when they're played as character types. And that's why John Hughes was a far better writer doing that sort of material than, than anybody else. Your middle name is Ralph, as in puke. Your birth date's March 12th. You're five, nine and a half. You weigh 130 pounds. When The Breakfast Club came up and we had shot 16 Candles, I remember John called me and, and he then told me about the premise and the whole thing. And I remember him pointing out the details of that character and how it would be different. You know, he's more introverted, quiet, little shy guy that ultimately becomes the voice for the group. He writes the letter and the whole thing. Who are you? He, just plays. We see he plays a geek, gonna... but he plays a geek because he, he's a misfit and he's awkward. He's an awkward adolescent. And he's not the cool guy, and he's not the, the best-looking guy, but he's the guy that you automatically go to for sympathy in all these films. In Breakfast Club, we're not saying, I'm, I'm Judd Nelson. We're saying, I'm Anthony Michael Hall. That's who I am. I think even the Judd Nelsons of the world probably identify with Anthony Michael Hall in that film. Michael's just, just lovable. You know, can't root against him. Never laid anyone around here? Oh. You and Claire did it. Like when I out him, I go, oh, you know, oh, you've been with her? When I say, oh, he says that you two, and then she turns, then Molly turns on Michael for a moment, and he's still gonna be my friend. You know what I mean? He's that, he's got a kind of confidence that there's nothing we can really do to hurt him. The only thing that can hurt him is himself. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Your dad work here? You know, Michael is embarrassed. There's no doubt about it. They know each other. And it's not a bad thing, but he's embarrassed about it. But he realizes it right away when I make fun of him, and we all see him now having to cover. Then when he's upset that Molly says on Monday we're all going to be how we were, uh, he's very believable when he says he would not do that. I believe him. I just want to tell each of you that I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't and I will not. Because I think that's real shitty. And he shows us when he's nice to Carl on the way out. See, Brian? Yeah, Carl. No, that, that's actually, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, like you get the sense that him and Carl are buddies. Claire makes the most astute observation because she says, because you have nothing to prove. Your friends idolize us or, or something like that. And then he says, which is true. You know, he has nothing to lose by befriending them. You're so conceited, Clint. You're so conceited. And there's that amazing moment of Anthony Michael Hall's wrenching sobs. <laughs>
Well, fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> Michael was just, Michael was, he's so, he's, he's a very sweet, sweet man. And he was just, he was lovely. And he, I don't care, he doesn't like this, but I did, I had this nickname for him, which was Milk and Cookies, and I called him that all the time, which he did not like at all. I don't know what that means. Would you say that to Sean Penn after Bad Boys was wrapped? I don't think so. <laughs> He's just so funny. And then during that whole thing, his, I don't know, I just, I just had to make a like, mental block against Michael for the whole thing. I remember that little moment where like, I hit myself on the shoulder or something as if I'm doing a good job. Yeah, it is, it's cute, you know, it's just a way to kind of wrap it up and it's a way to give, you know, the other two have sort of paired off. He got, he got the shaft in that, in that sense. But he's also the smartest one, and he would have written the best letter. Um, and so that's why it had to be him as well. That was sort of Brian's department to take over there for everybody at the end. Because the thought being that he's, you know, excels as, an, as a student, but he's also sort of uh, digested the, the, the group therapy aspects of it and is then assigned to write that, that letter at the end. Coach thinks I'm a winner. So does my old man. I'm not a winner because I want to be one. I'm a winner because I got strength and speed, kind of like a racehorse. It's about how involved I am in what's happening to me. Emilio, to me in The Breakfast Club, is the real sleeper of the character. There's something subtle and brewing about him that doesn't necessarily come off, even when you see the film for the first time. And I think that the more you see the film, the more you appreciate his performance, which I think is very subtle and good. I think it's obvious that John Hughes' allegiance is with geeks. So I imagine, and, and this is just speculation on my part, but I imagine that it was challenging to write this sort of relatable jock. And he pulls it off, and uh, you do feel for him. I like him. Of the five who seemed so disconnected, to me, he seemed like the guy who made the most effort. He's kind of like the pivot man in the, in the five of them, where he'd come to the defense of Molly Ringwald if Judd Nelson kind of said something inappropriate. Two hits. Me hitting you, you hitting the floor. I think he was very honest in, in the way he treated Ali Sheedy. She was being weird, and he'd say, why are you being so weird? Okay, fine. But I didn't dump my purse out on the couch and invite people into my problems. More than any one of them, if you really think about when you first meet Andy, he's in the pickup truck with his dad, and his dad says, You want to miss a match? You want to blow your ride? Now, no school is going to give a scholarship to a discipline case. He really doesn't say a whole lot, but you know immediately when he gets out of the truck and he slams the door, you just kind of know immediately without him saying anything that he's not, that his dad is putting this pressure on him. That may not ring as true to many people, but it does to athletes. They know exactly what he's talking about. It's all, it's just that that elite athlete reveals him or herself a lot of times pretty early. I expected a little more from a varsity letterman. And the pressure begins on them that he's going to go to college because he's going to get a scholarship, without which he's not going to go to college. He's going to get a shit job, which means that maybe when I say, hey, uh, you know, Andy here is thinking about a job being a, you know, in the custodial arts or whatever. And uh, it's like that moment where it's like, hey, at least for me reading it, it's like you go, that's not a fun moment for Andy, you know, and, and that pressure. And then why he's in there, you know? tells this ridiculous story about taping a guy's butt cheeks together. I mean, it is ludicrous, but it happens. And he's so like, I think he's great in the movie. He said, I did it for my old man. I tortured this poor kid because I wanted him to think that I was cool. He also had great energy and a great working spirit, and to the point where, like, in between takes, he'd be writing. I mean, the guy was on it. He does a cool dance. One thing that jumps out at me is Emilio Estevez kind of running around and singing and he runs into a room and he screams and the window shatters. It's completely absurd, but somehow John Hughes manages to kind of weave in these absurd moments and then still the movie makes perfect sense. It's a movie, so you get to sometimes do things that are unlikely but not impossible. I mean, there was nothing done that was impossible in this movie. He's using these devices that are more visual than 
expositional, but you understand exactly what Amelia Stead is going through at that moment. He um, certainly packed a big lunch. <laughs>